So hello everyone, I see who is asleep. Is everyone awake? Don't worry, I'm not gonna take a lot of time actually. I know you folks are already tired and waiting for the next break. Um, before I start, uh, just to give you a gist uh, that this talk is not an advanced or intermediate level talk. It's for the people who have just started their career or interested in data engineering and want to see that what are the different components or tools that are, uh, you know, tightly integrated with Kubernetes ecosystem and how they can use it and how it is going to be, uh, how Kubernetes actually helps in terms of building dynamic data pipelines and all those stuff. So if you have an expectation or if you have already worked with a very data intensive applications or systems where you have used Kubernetes already, uh, you may take a break already, <laughs> shouldn't be a problem. But this is mostly uh, going to be a beginner friendly talk where uh, we'll see some of the tools and you know how Kubernetes solves the data engineering problems. So we'll just to set the expectation, um, this talk is basically going to be a bird's art view around uh, how Kubernetes is being used in the data engineering spectrum, right? And I think a lot of people already may know because uh, the problem that Kubernetes already solves irrespective of whether it's data intensive or not, you will find that a lot of overlap will be there uh, on the compute layer and when it comes to the orchestration. And we'll see that how exactly the current data engineering spectrum looks like, what is a modern data stack, right? And what's the hype about it? And we'll also look into few tools. Of course, there are many tools, but uh, the tools that I've mentioned have used it and the ones that I've already experimented with. So again, if you have your favorite tool, feel free to interrupt in the middle and say, this is, this is all, also the one of the tools that has a really great support with Kubernetes, I've used it. Uh, this talk is not going to be a tutorial sort of thing. So I just wanted to say that. So starting with modern data stack, anyone have heard of this term, modern data stack? No one? Data engineering? OK. So, so, so the major difference between <clears throat> modern data stack and the typical data engineering, so for the folks who don't know what data engineering is, consider it as like, uh, you want to, uh, the process is basically you, you collect raw data, you extract basically and then process it and uh, do some transformation on top of it and put it where on the end application it is going to be used, whether it's analytic or if you want, if you are using uh, different customer uh, data platforms, if you want to use there, so mostly around that. And uh, so the modern differentiator between, I mean, if you see that, uh, the diagram, Mostly on the left hand side, you see that that's how the on-prem systems are, like where you deploy your system, uh, you build and put it on your on-prem. So the major differentiator between the legacy data stack and modern is that you use on-prem hardwares, or let's say even if you want to use uh, cloud providers, but then again, it's a typical deployment pattern or the uh, build process that you do. And in modern data stack, basically the tools are built around a cloud native ecosystem. So if you see here, this is how the typical data engineering and uh, modern data stack process looks like. So you have a data, data acquisition layer where all the data or the events are coming from mobile web servers and then in fact different SaaS tool that your company uses. This is very high level uh, diagram I'm talking about where you have uh, business oriented applications, right? And where you have end to end process from, let's say, take any example of B2B apps or B2C apps, right? And you uh, have different data integration tools where you want to procure or capture these events, right? And sort of perform uh, analytics on top of it, right? So these are the four layers, right? And if you see the last part of the, uh, this particular diagram, which talks about data, data acquisition, where now a lot of methodologies that have come into the picture, like people do ELT or uh, reverse ETL sort of thing, and a lot of customer data platforms, right, where your entire operation is actually performed on within data warehouse tools itself. So you put your tools on top of it and then directly you extract the data and put it to the different uh, customer or business user ending tools, right? So this is what a typical uh, modern data stack looks like and when it comes about where do we use Kubernetes here? So precisely if you see the layer called data orchestration, right? This is the part and the compute part is where Kubernetes is usually used whenever you are building a, a very 
high level or heavy data workload system. So I just wanted to give an overview of what uh, in basic terms modern data stack looks like. And we'll also see what Kubernetes helps with in terms of data engineering and as a data engineer if you, if you need to know Kubernetes or not or if you just focus on you know uh, traditional data engineering tools if you want to just build a data pipelines. We'll also look into a few tools and we'll see when to use it and that is exactly how the opposite of that will be when not to use it and then the conclusion. So as Pavitra introduced, uh, I'm Abhishek. Uh, I mostly do backend engineering. I've been doing that for the last six years. And uh, aspiring developer advocate as well. Uh, I've been work, I have worked with few companies doing uh, developer advocacy. And I'm a very Python fanboy sort of thing. Been doing that for a long time and uh, right now currently doing a bite of rust. I also run few communities across India. Uh, GTG Chennai, PyCon India, and then there are a few more a uh, few more uh, chapters. And if you want to connect with me over uh, LinkedIn or so, any social media platform, this is my username. Now the question comes, why do you need to use Kubernetes with data engineering or whatever data pipelines you use, right? And anyone can answer that. Just like a very obvious, why Kubernetes is being used. No one? Anyone can answer why, we, why do we use Kubernetes? Because it's it's trendy, or because sorry, yeah, that's right, scaling. But what sort of scaling? Yeah. So just to give it very short, of course, people will have a different answer to it. But then under the hood, these are the two main reasons why you should be using Kubernetes for your data pipelines or in in your data engineering prospectus. Of course, when it comes to scaling, and especially when it comes to compute scaling, right? Uh, I have also attached a uh, kind of use case where how Kubernetes is being used in the later slides, but to give you an example, consider like you have, depending on event workflows, like uh, whenever there's an event triggering, and this is a very extreme example I'm talking about, and depending on that, you have to start, let's say 100, 200, or 300 workflows, for example, and it, it depends on multiple concurrence requests that are coming on, right? So how do you manage that? Will you use only like tool which you have to keep on replicating and doing the same thing right so basically where you where you need to scale the compute capacity majority of the time that is when kubernetes will be used so let's say you have a job that needs a very heavy compute so what you will do for example you have a spark uh, job that is running and if you want to distribute the task you will run that on multiple nodes right at that time you can use kubernetes for example and then again, the way we are building data pipelines these days, right? Most of the things, right? There, is there anyone who is not using Docker in this room? For any app? Who is not using Docker? Okay, it looks like everyone is using it. Yeah, so we know that whatever application we use, we Dockerize it. Whatever, in fact, the same thing applies to all the data science, data pipelines, and ML models as well. We write it, we bundle it, and then we you know, countryize and then we deploy. That's how it works. But then again, uh, it's a traditional way. When you have to scale the dynamic workload, when I say dynamic, uh, the same example that I explained, if you have to orchestrate the containers or the entire data pipelines, that time you're going to use. These are the two main reasons. And just to deep dive into few more uh, advantages that Kubernetes gives you on top of it, as I explained already that the reason why Kubernetes is being used in traditional systems is the almost same reason, but with few shenanigans, right? So all, everyone loves using Docker, whether it's a DevOps or SRE team, or in fact, as an ML engineer, you write code and then you bundle it and then give it to, uh, right? So again, for the orchestration level, right? If you want to orchestrate those data nodes, how do you do that? That time Kubernetes is being used. And uh, declarative definition. So let's say you're, you, you are running a data pipeline where you have an error that says, okay, memory uh, ran out of, like uh, the memory is it's, it's short and that particular job failed. How do you fix it? Like the Kubernetes has a de uh, declarative definition, so you can just go ahead and increase the uh, size and then you can rerun the job or the pod and then voila your uh, like 
data pipeline runs again, and then it's time to execute. This is just one example. And then whenever we talk about building data pipeline, it's just not one engineer or two engineer, right? We have uh, data engineers or ML engineers. We also have data scientists who do post work on whatever data comes from data pipeline, and then we hand over whatever we have built to the SRA team. So it's it's like an entire, when it comes to enterprise level, I'm not talking about you, ha you run one person or two person uh, team, and then you are doing everything. But in a, uh, in a typical enterprise based scenarios, that's how it going to be. So the way it works is you, do, you define everything at once, and then you reuse it. So the, the handover process that takes off via using containers, again, that's easy. And when your data grows, uh, and if you want to increase the execution power of your platform as well, that time also uh, it helps you. So the giving an example of, let's say you, you are running a job on task, uh, multiple parallel processing, you want to do it. That time you can also uh, put this task on, let's say, five to six nodes, for example, and then it will run it. And then, OK. So as your data grows, you can scale it as well. And when I say uh, iterating faster, initially when you develop your first app, of course, it's going to be a crappy version of whatever data pipeline you use. And over the iteration, you're going to build more things on top of it. So whether if you want to enhance the ML uh, uh, model that you have used, or if you want to do A to B test, test testing, depending on uh, different users or uh, like a part of cluster, you can do that with different parameters. and. It's easy with Kubernetes to do that once your underlying low-level uh, stuff is done. So uh, just to give it, because I'm not going to show the demo, so this is one use case. Uh, this is a company called Zoom, uh, which is Berlin-based e-commerce app. Like, they have explained how they have used Kubernetes with Spark to, you know, uh, to streamline their entire data engineering pipeline. So you can uh, go ahead and read that. And uh, coming back to tools. These are the ones that I have used and my favorite because uh, when I started using Kubernetes, I was, I was completely lost because there are so many components, right? Uh, I had no clue which one to use when, to be honest, and I wanted to get my things done. So I don't know how many of you have used Apache Airflow. Anyone? Okay, how do you like it? Good. So it's so Apache Airflow is like grandmom of all the data engineering tools. Came at the start using as a scheduler and doing whatnot, right? But I don't like it. Um, I mean, of course, just to give a gist, uh, Airflow lets you write your entire data pipeline in Python code and in a way how DAGs work, right? So you have to write the code in that way and then you can do it. So ag again, a lot of people, for the simplicity sake, because Airflow is very popular, a data engineering tool. They go and start using it, and but then they can't scale much because by default, Airflow initially when it came, it, uh, it did not have support for you know compute scale and all those things. Like how Postgres is works best with a single node. Same goes with the Airflow. But then later on, again, uh, you have a Kubernetes operator, right? And you can run your Airflow jobs in that. And then the second comes the Argo. Uh, I'm sure people must have used it if. The typically I've seen in uh, cloud natives ecosystem or the people or the companies who are using a lot of Kubernetes tool, they usually use it for CICD pipelines, if I'm not wrong. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But you can actually use Argo to scale or in fact uh, build your data pipelines on Kubernetes. Again, if you are a fan of using YAML, go ahead and use that. Argo is uh, based on that. And the third one is Prefect, my, one of my favorites. Uh, so Airflow has a lot of drawbacks when it comes to creating dynamic DAGs, right? Uh, when I say dynamic DAGs, consider it like a one DAG as a one pipeline. And if you want to pass dynamic parameters and all, you have to rewrite everything again. And uh, you can't do, let's say, in a for loop, if you want to create five pipelines or five DAGs, you can't do that in Airflow, uh, at least in version one. So what happens is uh, you have to define everything. In fact, if you have a problem at the business level itself, then probably you have to streamline the entire schema, how the data comes and all. And that's how you can do it. Now, Prefect gives you a solution on top of it, a really good abstraction lever. You don't have to write a code as a DAG. Rather than you can create each function as a, as a 
a workflow in Prefect, and you can also pi pass the dynamic parameters on wall dot. And the same way it works on Kubernetes as well. So you, if you want to create FITO, I don't know if you have used Dask, it works in the same way, but if you want to uh, put it on the five to six nodes on, uh, let's say in Kubernetes configuration, you can do that as well. So each task, which if you want to send a Slack notification or read the data from PostgreSQL and then uh, uh, do some operation on top of it and then put it back to something else or some other tool, you can do that. And then Qflow and uh, other tasks, it's, it's, it works almost the same. But again, it's a preference how you use it because uh, people know about this tool, but it's more of a how you have started using it and more of an industry standard that people go with. But I love Prefect. I have used it very much in Dask as well. Since I come from Python background, I have a bit of bias for Prefect and Dask. Um, again, when to use it? Kubernetes is not a solution for all your data engineering problems. If you have a need to scale your pipeline, let's say more than 1,000, for example, just to give a hypothetical example. But if your pipelines are running fine, scale, you are able to scale on the single server, it's fine, you don't need it, right? That's fine. You don't need Kubernetes to run your pipelines. Again, if you want to automate the ML model management, go ahead. If you want to use uh, advanced level of ML ops, you can go ahead and use that. And uh, if you want to, as I explained uh, about experiments, if you want to do a lot of A to B testing, depending on the uh, cluster, on the cluster level, you can do that. And I, of course, for the data lineage, just add not in not in all three bullet points. If you don't want to do that, don't use Kubernetes. If you want to don't do, if you don't want to do the particular thing, just don't use it. So yeah, these are the main reasons I would say. Um, so in conclusion, uh, it was initially, to be honest, very hard for me uh, to get started with the Kubernetes, especially for deploying the data pipelines. Uh, it's not uh, like a one-stop solution, but then these tools, the modern data stack tools that have come that we have seen, it gives you a really good abstraction layer where you don't have to put a lot of effort. You can just use these tools and leverage the power of Kubernetes. So consider Kubernetes as a GPS, to you if you're a data engineer and then it helps you navigate if you want to do uh, cloud native things and if you don't want to get lost in containers. So thank you. If you want to access the slide, this is the URL and yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have a time? It's fine. Okay. So if you have questions, you can uh, take, take it off the stage, no problem. Yeah.